All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer here this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for a good night's rest. I hope everyone slept well, Lord, our family as well. We appreciate the prayers, thoughts of those who uh, were praying for us as we had a long travel day yesterday, Lord. A lot of cars and trucks on the road, but we thank you for safety, protection, a smooth trip, Lord. Thank you for the safety you've given the Kimmels as they were down here, Lord, for most of this week and uh, at Victory Baptist Bible now with us this morning. We certainly pray for them, Lord. Give them freshness and strength as they teach and preach this morning. And then, Lord, as they hit the road as well for traveling to Michigan. We pray for a good travel day, safety protection for them as well. Use them, Lord, here at this church. May we be an encouragement and blessing to them as I know that they will be to us. Lord, we thank you for this Memorial Day weekend as we remember, Lord, those who uh, have served and, Lord, were uh, killed in, in service or in some form, Lord, protecting this country. We thank you for our freedoms. We thank you for the freedom that we enjoy. We thank you, Lord, for your blessing on this country. And we ask your continued blessing, Lord, as this country honors you and glorifies you, Lord. We pray for, certainly for, uh, Lord, those that do not know you to turn to you, Lord, and know you as Savior. Lord, for those who have, but Lord, maybe have turned away from the word of God and the principles of the scriptures, Lord. Pray that we would have a turning back, Lord, to the things of the word of God and standing on the absolutes of the scriptures, Lord. And we thank you again, Lord, for those who are actively serving now, but especially for those who pay the ultimate price, Lord, for our freedoms, that we can enjoy this service today, that we can enjoy picnics tomorrow and the day off and the freedoms that many people around the world do not have an opportunity to enjoy, Lord. Thank you again for your goodness, your love, your faithfulness. Thank you for the freedom and the liberty we have in Jesus Christ through salvation and eternal home in heaven. We love you and thank you. May you be glorified today in the services, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to be with you. It's been a couple of years since Jim and I have been here. And uh, we'll give you a report on the traveling and all that stuff uh, in that. Um, I, I, for those of you that know me, I'm getting a lot of comments on the growth on my cheeks. <laughs> and I, I got tired of paying a quarter of hair for a haircut. So I just started buzzing that at least once a week and then I let it grow out here. My wife likes it, my mother hates it, which is even all the more reason to grow it. Amen. <laughs> yes. In there. Uh, amen. So uh, we, uh, we have been traveling some, not much. June and I, between the two of us, we're, we're falling apart. I saw a t-shirt that uh, I should have bought uh, because it may not be true in several months, but it said uh, on the front, it said, assembled in the 50s, all parts original, some still in working order. Right? <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 uh, but anyway, turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And also, in the same thing, saw another t-shirt and took a picture of my daughter's didn't like it. But it said, you can't tell me what to do. You're not my daughter. <laughs> Those of you with daughters that are still at home, when they get out, they get worse. <laughs> Ours are 40, 42. Uh, they have no lack of, you're not wearing that and that kind of stuff. You, you know what I mean? You know what I, mean? Now, I, I put it on because I'm not going to wear it. You, you know, that, that's one of my general answers. But anyway, this morning, we're going to take a look. I'm looking for a clock. What time do I need to be <coughs> 10, 10, 15 at the latest. You'll start seeing choir members coming in. <laughs> All right. 10, 15. Okay. I'm going to speak this morning on first things first. There's always an order and a progression to how you're supposed to do things. Right? right. Now, I like chocolate chip cookies. Do you like chocolate chip cookies? Yeah. No. My wife... You don't like them? Absolutely not. Yeah. I knew there was something. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. What? I'll enjoy it. Yeah, I'll enjoy it. All right. My wife and my daughters have perfected a chocolate chip cookie recipe. Now, you might eat them and not think, but to me, they're fabulous. Tremendous. And my wife is getting arthritis. In fact, she has to have a hand surgery uh, here in just uh, June the 6th. I'll tell you more about that in the service. But 
I have to do a lot of the stirring, which I don't mind at all, because I like what, and not only that, I like doing quality control, amen, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, I, uh, see, things have to be in a certain order. You can't put this in when it goes at the end. You gotta put the other stuff in, you know what I'm saying? There's a natural progression. You mess the progression up, it messes up the outcome, okay? First things first. Let's take a look. And now this passage is um, often used in missions, and I'm not going to apply it that way this morning. And part of this can be dealt with giving. The preacher did not ask me to speak on giving, and I'm not this morning. I'm going to be speaking on getting first things first. Amen? Hey, by the way, there's rules that preachers have. If you don't say amen when I think you should say amen, that means you didn't hear me and I have to start over. Amen? amen. <laughs> so in the morning service, you just ask yourself what time you want to eat lunch. <laughs> Go from there. All right. Follow along. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. <clears throat> Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we uh, receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And this they did, not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desire Titus, that as he hath begun, so he would also finish in this same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. By the way, when Paul says, I speak not by commandment, that means it's not been already given. Okay? Paul's word under the inspiration of God is authoritative. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's a little better. All right. For we know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for his sakes he became poor, that ye through poverty uh, might be rich. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be able to assemble together freely. Thank you for your love to us, your goodness. Thank you for the Lord Jesus and his death on the cross, paying the penalty for our sin, his <laughs> resurrection from the tomb. God, help us to never lose sight of what that means to us and what it costs you. We pray now that you would use your word in our hearts and our lives, and we ask it in my name. Amen. Now, the church of Corinth had trouble. Okay, that's an understatement. By the way, every church is made up of people. Amen? Amen. And people often have trouble. Amen. Now, I'm not, I, I, you know, your pastor's not letting me on any secrets. We ate with the Camards last night. Now, they told us everything. No, no. I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. The Camards and us only go back three and a half decades. And, uh, but, you know, there was none of that. Not at all. Okay. But to say that no one has a problem in a church is, is you know, you, you're believing in Santa Claus. You understand what I'm saying? But the church at Corinth had problems, real problems. And, I mean, we're not going to go through and list them all, but if you read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians together, it seems like there was always division. People griping, people bickering, and all that kind of stuff. And there are things that you don't have to agree on. But biblical doctrine and principle and direction is something you have to be together on. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who your favorite football team or baseball team is, what's your favorite car, all that kind of stuff. Y you know, you, we like to get together and, and give each other grief about that. <clears throat> we had somebody ask us yesterday, checking in the hotel, oh, you're from Wisconsin, where do you live? I said, we live halfway between Milwaukee and the home of the 13-time world champion Packers. Amen. All right. <laughs> and they laughed. And the woman was from Green Bay. All right. But anyway, okay. The church at Corn had problems. The members did not understand their roles or responsibilities. Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's a let's get involved sport. You understand what I'm saying? You, you know, we don't need people on the sidelines. Now, at the end of chapter 7, look at verse 16. Paul says, I therefore, or I rejoice therefore that I have confidence in you all things. He's just spent time correcting out, chewing them out and that kind of thing. But he says, I got confidence in you. Okay, now we come to our text. Paul is teaching the Corinthian church how to reach out to someone else. To look beyond themselves. You know, uh, the Christians were self-absorbed. They only thought of themselves. Sadly, we see that in American churches. Not every, I don't mean everybody, I don't mean every church, but you and I see that as we travel around. You know where we don't see it? Internationally. The Chinese believers are not self-absorbed. In India, they're not self-absorbed. India's Persecution is ramping up almost to what it is in China. Okay? Poor Latin world where they don't have anything and they're fighting the cartel and their government. They're together. But in American churches, everybody wants it their way. They think going to church is like going to Burger King. They want it my way. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, okay? As people see the Lord in His work, we can't help from being generous and giving of ourselves our time. Do you know, giving of our time, in my opinion, is harder than giving our money. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe you have too much spare time. You understand? Now, in America, we have all kinds of ideas. We complain about everything. Steve was talking about that in his testimony. You know, and, and we do, if we spend a little bit of time <clears throat> thanking people, it's amazing the opportunities it opens up. Our country is a mess. I'm not here to be political. It's on both sides of the aisle. And if you don't think so, once again, what I said about Santa Claus applies, all right? <laughs> it's tough. It's both sides of the aisle. A revival is our answer, not the government. The government is the problem. Okay? Now, having said that, I've talked to preachers saying, we have never been more well-received, our church, talking to people and sharing the gospel. See, before, we've never thought we've had a need in the United States. You say, what do you mean? Well, if you have a problem, you call your congressman and you get it taken care of. You know what I mean? You sue somebody and it's like hitting a lottery. You understand? Okay? In China, it's not that way. In India, it's not that way. In the Muslim countries, it's not that way. In those Stan countries, Stan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Shazikistan, Kahikawika, Mikistan, you know, all of those. Okay? When they pray, they know God is their only answer. And it's different. Been there and prayed with some of them. It is different. They know they have to get a hold of God. And yet, we, who the land of the free and the home of the brave, who have it easy, why isn't the gospel thriving in the United States? Why isn't it? Well, there's pornography, and there's drug addicts, and there's booze, and there's nasty movies, and the politicians, and all that. You know what God says? In 2 Chronicles 7, he doesn't say if the pornographers will quit, if Hollywood will quit, 
He says, if my people, which are called by my name. So he blames a different group of people than we like to blame. Are you with me? Okay. Now, you say, I thought you were going to be nice. Well, that's what you get for that. All right. Now, here you go. Let's take a look at this. We need to understand the situation here, 2 Corinthians. You know, look at verse 2. A great trial of affliction. You see that? A great trial of affliction. That means things weren't going well. We think we're persecuted for righteousness sake when we go to the grocery store and our favorite band of ice cream is out. You hear, and this is true. The woman that was in line, it, it was McDonald's or some fast food and they were out of something, she called 911. Oh, yeah. 911. <laughs> because yeah. they're out of whatever burger stuff you wanted. We have no idea what the problems are. You know, my wife and I saw a car, and this was probably five weeks ago. It was kind of a metallic maroon burgundy vet. Had the four pipes on the back. Oh, if I had money, I'd have gone home and ordered one. It was beautiful. Even my wife said it, and you know when your wife says it, it's something. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I've never had a sports car. I've always wanted a sports car. But I've really not done without. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? Do you understand that if you make the average American income, and that's somewhere between $35,000, dollars $40,000 a year, you live in the upper 1% of the world. Upper 1% of the world. Do you ever think of that? Upper 1% of the world. You may not get to drive the bet that I just described. You may not want to drive the bet I just described. I don't care. But you live in the upper 1% of the world. <clears throat> not our country. The world <coughs> of billions of people. You're a 1%. Do you ever think of that? How good we have it instead of complaining. The news media does a great job infecting our thinking. Okay? I have been to the border in Texas and Mexico. We go there. We normally spend at least a month, a year there or more. Not all at the same time sometimes, but we're down there. I wish that we had a border that was closed, but that we had a legitimate immigration system. But we'll never will. The Democrats want it for votes, the Republicans want it because of the hay they make off of it. It'll never happen, and it's both sides' fault. You say, have you ever met illegals? Yes. I know a family, the man's a deacon in the church where we do the recording. You say, he's illegal, he's a deacon, yes, he's one of the best men I've ever met. About 23 years ago, he and his wife had their first baby, and he, that child was not quite two. He's 25 today. The cartels came to him. This man works on big equipment, diesel equipment. We need you to do this, or we're taking your wife and your son. What would you have done? Well, it's the principle of the thing. What would you have done? They came to America. They had three other children. They had a girl, they had a boy, they had a girl. Those kids call us grandpa and grandma. The boy is 25 today. That mom, Diane, speaks about as much English as I speak Spanish. I can speak some. Buenos dias. <coughs> you know. Buenos tardes, buenos noches, you know, all that stuff. All right? She taught my wife how to make real tortillas. <laughs> it's against house rules to buy those stinking things from the grocery store. Real flour tortillas. The teenage daughters had to translate. But my wife makes them. In fact, 
when we go home, she's making up a double batch because she has surgery, as I said, coming on her hand. And I'm a terrible cook. All right? <laughs> they were in a great trial of affliction. We get, uh, we're on the ministry that we work with in China. We get monthly reports. This is not stuff you're going to get in the news. And it's not stuff that everybody's going to get. If you signed up and got on this, you wouldn't get the same information we get. Do you understand? You know what I'm saying? We're not anybody special, but they know us and trust us and so forth. Last month's information, there was a pastor in China that was found hung. The official Chinese report was that he had been depressed. The man that wrote the, in charge of the ministry that sent this out just said, that's not what happened. And all of us know what. How many of you think that's going to happen to you for being a Christian? We are the exception to that, not the rule around the world. Think about that. We're the exception. We're not the only country, but we're the exception, not the rule. Okay? They were in great trial of affliction. By the way, who was the leader of the known world when Paul was writing this under the inspiration of God? Rome. Rome, but who, which Roman emperor? Nero. You know, the guy that put Christians on spits and lit them for lights in his gardens and stuff? That guy. I didn't think government was going well there. Okay, sorry, I, I just, I can't stay in front of it, my bad. All right, a great trial of affliction. Okay, we, we, in America, it may come, but it's not here yet. We get frustrated, we get irritated with some of the things that go on, but we, we have no idea. And yet it says, the abundance of their joy. And that word in the original, abundance, it means super abundance. Super abundance, not just abundance. And the source of joy. You know why so many times we don't have joy? We look for it in the wrong places. We think money will bring joy. I'm not saying that more money would bring sadness, but that, that's not the lasting joy. Sometimes relationships, we think, will bring us joy. People ever let you down? If you say, no, you haven't been friends with somebody for a long time. All right? I don't mean everyone, but, you know, we look for it in the wrong place. God brings joy. God brings satisfaction. And he doesn't always bring it in places that we think that he would bring it. You understand? Do you understand? Amen. Okay? All right? With that. And look at this. It says, and their deep poverty. And this is the giving. And, and I'm not going to spend time on this. But they lack reserves. They lack reserves. But they were liberal in their giving. They saw a need. Uh, June and I had a family. And they were uh, Hispanic. We did not know they made us a meal, and they didn't have food to eat. You ever had that happen to you? It's okay with me if it never happens again to me. Sit there and eat it while they can. You say, well, I don't know what it was. I don't care. Did you like it? That's not the point. You eat it, period. And if you didn't, you lie and tell them how great it was. <laughs> you know, well, they sit there and watch you eat while they can't. June and I have never done that. You ever done that for anybody? They did it for us. Take a look there at verse 5. And this they did. Not as we hope, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. They first gave themselves to the Lord. You say, well, I did that when I got saved. 
And, and you should give yourself to the Lord when you get saved. Does that do it forever? Any of you ever struggle and have to confess sin? Let me reword that. Any of you should confess sin. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right. And, uh, you know, certain things irritate the fire out of me. Now, my wife is the most even-keeled person I've ever met in my life. I mean, it's sickening. Uh, it takes a lot to irritate her. Now, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I'm not going to share and, and, and so forth, but there are things that just irritate me. Don't bother her. One of the things that really irritates me is bad drivers. They irritate you. You know what I'm saying? Uh, every now and then you will just reach over and pat me on the leg. <laughs> You know, you're in a traffic jam. We were in several yesterday from wrecks and that kind of stuff, not construction. And, you know, and there's always one or two of these dear children of God that think that their time is more important than everybody else, and they're zipping and cutting. And you know what I'm talking about? I had one of those yesterday. Say, so what'd you do? Well, if he didn't hit his brakes, he would have gone off the edge. Let's just say that. All right. <laughs> There's, you, you know, I let guys in, and then you take your turn and all this. But anyway, it's just irritating. But I do drive a lot more defensively than I used to. When you're on the road all the time, you don't need your car, even if you're in the right, in the shop, being fixed. You know what I mean? They gave themselves to. Can you see Jesus shaking his fist and honking at somebody going down a road? This is a true story. When June and I lived in town, when I pastored in Mountaintop, we were downtown, and when we were having the meetings at Victory Baptist, we drove by it. I said, that's where it happened, right there. A nun was honking and shaking her fist at some guys. <laughs> I said, that's where it had you. said, are you sure? I said, I guarantee you, that's where it was, right there. It was on our left, the parking lot where this happened and stuff. You just don't see nuns. You don't get that picture of an old nun doing that. You know what I'm saying? But we need to give ourselves to the Lord so that we can be a witness for the Lord. As I said, right now, I talk to preachers and they said they're getting greater opportunities to share the gospel with people. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago about the border. I wish that it was controlled, but it's not. Do you know what the Lord's doing? He's bringing the world to us. We have an opportunity to win people to the Lord get them in churches, get them baptized, get them discipled. And you know what? If they get sent home, what are they going back with? The gospel. We need to not let the news media affect how we think. And we need to let God affect how we think. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And we need to take advantage of opportunities. Do you know, if you were with me in McAllen, Texas, and we're in a suburb, I can take you to the cages where they held the people. I know where they are. I know in Donna, Texas, which is a southern suburb of McAllen, where they had the baby formula held. I can take you to that. I, I know where it is. Okay? But is that really the issue? Is that really the issue? Getting those people to the Lord is the issue. We have the freedom to share the gospel. Now think about this. How desperate are people to leave their homeland and walk thousands of miles to swim across the river to come to our country? Are they desperate? Are all of them criminals? 
No. Many of them just want opportunity. And if we're thinking right, looking at things right, we need to share the gospel with them. Not just, oh, you, you know, you shouldn't be here anyway. Well, they are here. All righty? And I've already told you, I wish we had a legitimate immigration system and a closed border. Every illegal family I have met, and it's about this many, all of them agree, all we need is a legitimate immigration system in our country. Why don't we do that instead? But that's not the problem. We can't do that. But we can share the gospel with people. Amen? Amen. They first gave themselves to the Lord. And I have, it just went to 1010 while I was speaking. All right? Uh, there, while I was looking. All right? It's good to see you men. Many of your faces I recognize. Some of you I don't. Sorry about that. But it's good to see you again. Look forward to being with you upstairs. Preacher, do you want to say anything? No, you can close us in prayer if you'd like, and we'll be dismissed. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together. Lord, I pray you will help us to give ourselves to you first. Bless the morning service in Jesus' name. Amen.